Good morning, everybody. And yes, it is morning for me. It's a bright, sunny spring day, in fact. And what better way to get it started, I say, than to record the voiceover for my latest YouTube video. Today, we're going to be responding to Eric Manning again. He's the guy who runs the Testify YouTube channel. It's a pretty good channel. His videos can be entertaining. Occasionally, they're informative. They can be a little silly sometimes. Just recently, he released a video with this headline, Fascinating Proof That Angels Are Real. But you know what? That's okay. I don't mind a silly video once in a while. I may even make a silly video myself. I might be doing it right now. Ah, but I digress, because what I really want to talk about today is the gospel according to John. Mr. Manning has made a few videos touching on that, and I won't be able to get to all of them, but do check out these two here, especially the one called Strong Evidence That John Wrote the Fourth Gospel. I'm putting links in the description, and as always, I recommend you watch his videos first before viewing my critique here. Mr. Manning presents a number of different claims and arguments in his videos, but for the sake of brevity, a lot of those I'm just going to skip for now. However, there were a few things that I found especially interesting and which I do want to discuss. In particular, he has this idea that the narrative includes too many vivid details to be the work of a non-eyewitness. Oh, and before we dive any further into Mr. Manning's specific arguments, I should mention very briefly that many scholars believe that John's Gospel betrays the hands of multiple authors or editors, writing over perhaps a lengthy period of time and producing a plurality of editions of the Gospel text. It's a complicated subject with no firm consensus, and it's also beyond the scope of this video today. However, it is something to keep in the back of our minds as we proceed. But let's return to Mr. Manning and see what he has to say about whether the author of the Gospel of John was an eyewitness. John knows details about specific people for no apparent reason. He's the only writer to mention Nicodemus or Lazarus or Judas' father Simon or Malchus. Unfortunately, there's little force in this argument. To see what I mean, consider that the apocryphal Gospels contain yet more names, but we don't therefore accept them as eyewitness authorities. There was in fact a tendency to insert names into the gospel tradition on no authority at all. Consider Malchus, for instance. He's perhaps a special case since he already appears, albeit unnamed, in the other three gospels at the scene where Jesus is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's worth noticing, though, that there are considerable differences in the versions which may reflect a certain development in the accounts. The ear in Matthew and Mark becomes the right ear in Luke and John. Luke tells of the healing of the ear when the others don't. And the fourth evangelist is able to give the names of the swordsman, Peter, and of course the victim, Malchus, who were both left unidentified in the synoptic versions of the story. So does this reflect an eyewitness recollection? Well, maybe, but there's ample evidence that names can be added to stories on a creative impulse, which is why so very little can be concluded from John's modification of this tradition of Jesus' arrest. To give a few other examples, the thieves on the cross have been given different names in different texts, such as the Gospel of Nicodemus, Zoathan and Hamada, or Dismas and Gestas, etc. The captain of the sepulchre guard is called Petronius in the Gospel of Peter. The Magi in Matthew chapter 2 have likewise been given individual names in the tradition of the church. And we can now add John's Gospel to this list of ancient Christian authors who may have creatively supplied names to fill in the gaps in their sources. Let's return now to Mr. Manning and see what other examples he has to share. John mentions very oddly specific numbers, like there were six water pots when Jesus turned the water into wine. The people told Jesus that it took the temple 46 years to be built. The Samaritan woman had five previous husbands. The paralytic was sick for 38 years. The apostles rode for 25 to 30 stadia before they saw Jesus walking on the water. Lazarus was dead for four days. Mary's perfume was worth 300 denarii. The disciples caught 153 fish. Do these specific numbers indicate that the author of John's Gospel was an eyewitness? Well, again, maybe, but it may also be replied, first, that they may have been taken by the evangelist from sources, and secondly, that such features are precisely what a writer adds to his work in order to give it verisimilitude. I'll talk more about that second point in a bit, but for now let's illustrate how the first point might work. 
Consider the nard that was supposedly worth 300 denarii, which comes from John's story of the anointing at Bethany. Quote, Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. Unquote. The thing is, though, this tradition of the 300 denarii probably doesn't come from John, not originally at least. In fact, a version of the story occurs in all four Gospels, and in Mark's version, the figure of 300 denarii likewise appears. Some biblical scholars suspect, then, that this story has its origins in one or more common traditions. Mark and John in particular are sometimes seen as sharing that tradition. On the other hand, there is another possibility, which is that John may simply be depending on the Gospel of Mark for his information. And although most scholars today argue for John's independence of the synoptic tradition, not everyone agrees. The issue, as it turns out, is quite difficult to solve, and a solid minority of scholars have favored John's dependence upon synoptic material. This episode at Bethany is a case in point for why so many scholars suspect that John may have used Mark, perhaps even directly. Michael Reddish explains, quote, Only Mark and John describe the value of the ointment that's used to anoint Jesus as being 300 denarii. Even more interesting is the presence in Mark and John of an unusual word to describe this ointment. Both Gospels describe the ointment using the Greek word pastikos, usually translated pure, although the word is so rare in ancient Greek that we're not certain of its meaning. The word pastikos occurs nowhere else in the New Testament and is rarely found outside the New Testament." Unquote. Despite being in the minority, I have to admit that I'm partial to this view myself. If it's correct, then rather than sharing a common tradition, either John copied the 300 denarii figure directly from Mark's gospel, or he got the figure from someone else who had read Mark, or something along those lines. So I don't think the 300 denarii figure is any clear indicator of eyewitness recollection, but let's look at another of Mr. Manning's examples where Jesus attends the famous wedding at Cana and miraculously turns the water into wine. Quote, now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out, and take it to the chief steward. The steward tasted the water that had become wine. Why would the evangelist insist on there being precisely six stone jars? Eric Manning believes it's because John was the author and happened to remember that there were six of them. Perhaps. But then it's also possible, though by no means certain, that the number six could be symbolic. Scholars like C.K. Barrett conjecture in particular that six being less by one than seven, that's supposedly the number of completeness and perfection, might possibly indicate that the Jewish dispensation typified by its ceremonial water was partial and imperfect. The use of symbolism like this certainly wouldn't be out of character for John, who makes it abundantly clear that he is, in fact, using symbols to make some of his points. For example, the repeated statements identifying Jesus as the light of the world establish light as a core symbolic image, with darkness as its counterpart. Bread also functions symbolically when John says, I am the bread of life. On the other hand, any symbolic interpretation of the number six in this passage will have to remain conjecture, as nothing in the narrative reinforces a specific symbolic meaning for it. But there does seem to be a healthy dose of symbolism in other elements of the story. Craig Coaster explains, quote, The primary symbol in this episode is the transformation of water into wine, and the supporting symbols are the stone jars that held the water. The text states that the jars were for the Jewish rites of purification. If the statement is given full weight and the jars are understood to represent Jewish rituals, then the transformation of water into wine signals the beginning of a new order which will transform and replace Jewish practices. So even though the specific symbolism in the number six remains speculative, that speculation is made much more plausible by the somewhat more overt symbolism accompanying the episode.
And by the way, it's not just modern scholarship that finds symbolism here. Commentators throughout history have also seen symbolism in John's use of the number six. For instance, Origen, writing in the late second or early third century, had this to say about it, quote, Now six water vessels are appropriately spoken of with regard to those persons who are purified by being placed in the world. For we read in six days, which is the perfect number, this world and all things in it were finished, unquote. The great St. Augustine also found symbolism in the passage. Quote, Those six jars signify the six ages in which prophecy has never been wanting. The six periods of time, therefore, arranged and distinguished, as it were, by six hinges, would be like empty vessels unless they were filled by Christ, unquote. And Augustine's interpretation seems to have found great popularity in the Middle Ages. In almost all the medieval commentaries on this passage, the six jars of water, as in Augustine's commentary, are symbols of the six ages of the world, and the filling with wine is a symbol of Christ filling the law and prophets with grace and truth. As fascinating as a symbolic interpretation might be, though, I'm not completely convinced. It's not that it's an implausible explanation. Indeed, it's difficult for us to appreciate the significance and fascination of numbers in the ancient world. Nevertheless, the explanation for the six stone water jars may be far simpler. Maybe instead, the author of John's Gospel was simply a skilled literary artist. Consider what the German theologian Hans Windich had to say about it. Quote, To a much greater extent than the synoptics, John is literature because he has quite a different mastery of his material than they do. He's able to shape the scenes vividly and dramatically. In the composition of the whole, as in the shaping of its individual parts, John proves himself a master of the literary art, who leaves the synoptics, these collectors and redactors of popular tradition, far behind him." Unquote. And so, for a good fiction writer, these spots of narrative color are exactly what we should expect to find. As Andrew Lincoln puts it, vivid details are part and parcel of an omniscient narrator's perspective in good storytelling. Not surprisingly, Eric Manning seems to have anticipated this move, and his standard response, found in a couple of blog posts and at least one of his YouTube videos that I'm about to show you, is to loosely quote C.S. Lewis. Of this text, there are only two possible views. Either this is reportage, or else some unknown writer in the second century, without known predecessors or successors, suddenly anticipated the whole technique of modern novelistic, realistic narrative. If it is untrue, it must be a narrative of that kind. It pains me that I'm about to disagree so dramatically with Lewis, because he really is one of my very favorite human beings. Please do not take what I'm going to say here as any sort of excuse not to read his brilliant works of both fiction and nonfiction. I especially recommend Out of the Silent Planet and Paralandra. But when it comes to this point about vivid imagery in John's Gospel, I'm sorry to say I think he was just plain mistaken, and in a couple of different ways. Richard Bauckham reminds us that he liked to reduce matters to a choice of bluntly stated alternatives, only one of which seems credible. To be honest, though, this seems like little more than rhetorical sleight of hand. How could he have failed to recognize this evangelist's storytelling skills? How can he not have noticed that, along with the elements of what we might like to imagine as realism in the Johannian dialogues, there's also an artificiality to them? We don't need to trade in these kinds of generalities either. Lewis himself, in the very same essay, acknowledged that we had better turn to examples, and that's exactly what we're going to do here. To give one of my favorites, consider a different wedding scene. Not the wedding at Cana, where Jesus turned water into wine, but rather a wedding in India, recorded by the Acts of Thomas. This legendary Acts of Thomas, originally composed in Syriac, is an account purporting to tell the adventures of the Apostle Judas Thomas as he carried the gospel message east of Antioch, converting communities and kingdoms in Mesopotamia and India. As I read this excerpt aloud, please take note of the level of graphic detail packed into these few sentences. Quote, when they had dined and drunk, and crowns and perfumes had been brought, each took perfume, and one anointed his face, another his beard, and the others different parts of the body. 
And the apostle Thomas anointed the crown of his head, and put a little of the ointment in his nostrils, and dropped it also in his ears, and applied it also to his teeth, and carefully anointed the parts round about his heart. But the crown that was brought to him, wreathed with myrtle and other flowers, he put on his head, and he took a branch of reed in his hand and held it. And the flute girl, holding her flute in her hand, went round them all, and when she came to the place where the apostle was, she stood over him, playing the flute over his head a long time." Unquote. Are we really to believe that these touches of detail are simply too oddly specific, as Eric Manning might put it, to be anything but eyewitness reminiscences? The Acts of Thomas appears to have been written in the early 3rd century. Does that really mean, as Lewis might argue, that the author must have been writing accurate history since he couldn't have, as Lewis puts it, suddenly anticipated the whole technique of modern, novelistic, realistic narrative? On the contrary, the more successful the narrative art of fiction is employed, the ever more dangerous it becomes to read too much between the lines to find something historical behind or beyond the story. Nicholas Horsfall probably had it right when he cautioned that an alert understanding of inventivity and falsification is increasingly necessary in the study of ancient novels, biography, history, mythography, even grammar and codicology. As he aptly summed up, the more varied, complex, and specific the details of the text, the more they proclaim their falsity. This general point about literary creativity is really the most important one, in my opinion, and so I'm quite tempted to just stop the video here, but I still think it's worthwhile to continue on a bit longer so that we can look at two more of Mr. Manning's specific examples, which I think are somewhat enlightening. And then after that, we'll go ahead and wrap things up. And there's other little details that are brought out. Like when Jesus fed the 5,000, the loaves that were used were barley loaves. The branches in the triumphal entry were palm branches. When Jesus warmed himself by the fire, we're told in John's gospel that it was a charcoal fire. We read that Jesus's tunic was seamless, woven from top to bottom. Let's consider the barley loaves first, which appear in John's version of the miraculous feeding of the 5,000. Quote, when he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. One of his disciples said to him, There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. From the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets." Unquote. The feeding of the five thousand is the only miracle story to appear in all four Gospels. I should probably also mention as an aside that there's another story of the feeding of four thousand people recorded in Mark and Matthew. The various accounts differ in many of the details, but they still have so much in common that the view is very widely held that there were two independent versions of the same tradition at the pre-canonical stage, of which Mark has followed one in chapter 6 of his gospel and the other in chapter 8. In any case, it turns out that this story seems to have been influenced by episodes in the Old Testament. This isn't surprising, as passages in the Hebrew scriptures frequently inspired elements in the New Testament. Scholars suspect in particular that a few of the scenes in the books of First and Second Kings may have inspired the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000 in Mark, and by extension, also the story in John. And it's not hard to see why this is. Consider, for instance, 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 41 through 44, translated from the LXX, that's the Greek version of the Old Testament. Quote, and Elisha said to Gizi the lad, Pour for the people, and let them eat. And a man passed through from Beth Sarisa, and he brought to the man of God from the first products twenty barley loaves and fruit cakes. And he said, Give it to the people, and let them eat. And his attendant said, Why should I set this before a hundred men? And he said, Give it to the people and let them eat, for this is what the Lord says, They shall eat and leave some behind. And they ate and left some behind according to the word of the Lord." Unquote. The similarities between this episode and the feeding of the 5,000 in the Gospels are obvious, and the question immediately becomes, to what extent, if any, was John's story modeled after this account? Some scholars, Rudolf Boltman for instance, have argued that there's no proof that Second Kings had any influence on John's narrative. 
But other scholars reply that the agreements are simply too great. Men are sated, and yet there's food left over. Likewise, a boy supplies the food in John's Gospel, just like a boy distributes the food in Second Kings. And remember the barley loaves that Eric Manning thinks are marks of eyewitness reminiscence? Well, apparently, John included that detail in the story because it's barley bread that Elisha feeds his crowd in Second Kings. Even the same Greek phrases are used in both accounts. Piderion for the boy, and Artus Krithenus for the barley loaves. Please also note that I'm using my own Hatsothian pronunciation of the ancient Greek language here. It's much underrated, but I think it will catch on. Anyway, as a last example, we can talk about the seamless tunic. It comes from the crucifixion scene in John chapter 19. Quote, when the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Eric Manning apparently thinks John mentioning the seamless tunic in this passage must be another eyewitness reminiscence. That's certainly possible, of course, but perhaps there's a better explanation. The first century historian Josephus, writing sometime perhaps in the year 93 or 94, tells us that the high priest also wore a seamless tunic. Quote, the high priest puts on a tunic of blue material, but this tunic is not composed of two pieces to be stitched at the shoulders and at the sides. It is one long woven cloth." Unquote. Some scholars believe that John's reference to Jesus' seamless tunic in the gospel calls back to the seamless robe worn by the high priest. Helen Bond explains, quote, it's difficult to read the reference to Jesus' seamless tunic in John 19.23 as anything but a reference to the high priestly robe that was similarly woven from one piece of cloth. As the Son of God dies on the cross, the seamless robe of the high priest is redundant and discarded. God's people are about to be reconstituted around Christ." Unquote. This kind of symbolism is not without precedent. Philo uses the high priest's seamless robe as a symbol of the Logos, the eternal principle of the universe, and Cyprian uses it as a symbol of the undivided church. Perhaps more significantly, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 5, we also read, quote, Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Here the connection is made explicit. For the author of Hebrews, what Jesus did through his death on the cross was seen as the goal and fulfillment of the sacrificial ritual performed by the high priest on the Day of Atonement. Even so, not everyone's convinced. Although the description of the high priest's robe in Josephus employs the same Greek term as John does for the tunic, nevertheless, the high priest's garment was a long flowing outer robe fastened with a gold embroidered belt, and that's got to be very different from the presumably inner tunic mentioned in John's Gospel. It's also suspicious that, as far as John goes, a high priest Christology plays no role elsewhere in the narrative. Unlike the epistle to the Hebrews, the fourth gospel doesn't dwell on Jesus' high priestly ministry. Perhaps instead, the true explanation for the seamless tunic may be as simple as John reading the creative influence of the Old Testament scriptures into the details of his passion narrative. Remember that John quotes Psalm 22 verse 18, that's verse 19 if we read the Septuagint version, which incidentally, John follows exactly. It turns out, though, that the two lines of the psalm verse are in poetic synonymous parallelism, whereby the same thing is said twice in different words. But John thinks of two distinct actions pertaining to separate items of apparel. To see what I mean, we can look at the psalm and the Gospel of John side by side. I've color-coded the parallelism to make it easier to see. The first part of the psalm appears in green, where the clothing is divided. I've put the second part of the psalm in blue, where they cast lots for the clothes. And of course, you can see the corresponding parallelism in John. For some interpreters, this is a sign that the evangelist misunderstood the parallelism of the psalm. But just to be clear, that's not what I'm saying. 
He may have misunderstood it, but then again, it may be instead that John's literal interpretation was entirely deliberate. For instance, Matthew's Gospel makes the same kind of literal application of a quotation from Zechariah where we find a similar poetic parallelism, and this may suggest a conscious use of the artifice of parallelism in Jewish interpretation. Whatever the case may be, the upshot is that John evidently decided to draw a distinction between dividing the clothes on one hand and casting lots for the clothes on the other. And so it very well could be that John emphasizes that Jesus' robe was seamless simply as a narrative creation to explain why lots were cast. In order to get the prophecy from Psalm 22 to fit, John needed the soldiers in his story to cast lots for something, and so this is what he came up with to make that happen. The idea here is that because the tunic was woven from a single cloth, it couldn't be torn without substantial damage, and so that's why instead of dividing it up like the other clothes, the Roman soldiers instead agree to cast lots, each presumably hoping to preserve the value of the garment and secure it as his own. What can we take away from all this? Eric Manning was apparently quite impressed when he discovered this list of colorful details in John's Gospel. I don't know how much he investigated those details on an individual basis. When I investigated, well, you've all just seen some of the information I found, and it sure didn't seem to support the idea that John's Gospel was written by an eyewitness. I hate to say it, but if anything, I'm even more skeptical now that any of those bits of color go back to the historical Jesus at all, to say nothing of them being written down by a first-hand eyewitness source, as Eric Manning believes. So was the Gospel of John written by an eyewitness? Perhaps more realistically, does it maybe contain written eyewitness source material? That's certainly possible, I suppose, but we'll need more than just colorful details in the text to support that hypothesis. But anyway, I think that's it for today. Uh, please note, this wasn't by any stretch of the imagination a comprehensive overview of the issues. There are lots of other things to discuss when considering authorship and potential eyewitness sources for John's Gospel, but I hope you can all take this for what it is, which is a closer look at one of the common apologetic arguments. But yeah, that's it for now. Thanks for watching, everybody. Until next time.